All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, dear doctors and guest partners. Um, good morning, Kiran, and good morning, Miss Maris. Thank you for the, taking the time to join us for our webinar on the role of microbiome on immune response this morning. So some reminders before we start. This says this webinar will be recorded, so we will ask everyone to kindly put your microphone on mute unless you want to share something with the group. Secondly, please reserve all your questions at the end of the lecture, but you may send advanced questions or concerns through the chat box. Mira, Jane, and I will be monitoring them. And then, if you wish to have a copy of the presentation after the webinar, please send us your name and your email address through the chat box so we can get back to you. Being the new normal amidst the COVID-19 pandemic requires all of us to be mindful of our immune system now more than ever. A lowered immune response could pos possibly be caused by digestive problems because 80% of the immune, of immune system receptors are located in the intestines. This is why we have invited Kiran Krishnan for another learning session where he will discuss recent studies on gut and immune response modulation. To talk about this test, we have invited a guest speaker from the microbiome labs. So he's a research microbiologist, a hands-on R&D in the fields of molecular medicine and microbiology. He is the co-founder and the chief scientific officer at microbiome labs, a leader in microbiome and probiotic research. He is also currently involved in over 18 novel human clinical trials on probiotics and the human microbiome. He has published clinical trials in peer-reviewed scientific journals and several global patents in his name. Dear doctors, it is an honor to present to you Mr. Kiran Krishnan. Hi, Raj. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everybody. So great to be with you again. Uh, I think this is the second or maybe third or fourth webinar we've done. Uh, I stopped counting after a little while. And uh, of course, it'd be amazing to be able to do this in person uh, in Manila, somewhere in the Philippines. But um, I'm very Oops, sorry, I think I was muted the whole time. Maybe not. Um, anyway, if you didn't hear the first part of what I said, uh, what I was saying is that um, I'm, I'm really excited and honored to be able to do this presentation for you today. Thank you so much for joining me. I know um, you've got a number of other things to do, so I really appreciate your time in, um, in getting to, to go through this topic together. This is an incredibly relevant topic. I know in the U.S., um, this is something that I've had to lecture on. I've been invited to lecture on now maybe 15 times already uh, because the topic is so important, relevant in light of the pandemic that's going on. So every, everybody really wants to understand, you know, what is at the root cause of immune dysfunction? What is creating risk for people in terms of dealing with the new pathogen? And how can we optimize immune function? And the good news is there are some really clear connections between the microbiome and the immune system. And in fact, um, you know, the microbiome or the immune system would cease to exist without the microbiome itself. And the microbiome acts as the eyes and ears of the immune system for in large part. And I'll explain that as I go through the presentation. So what I'll do in the beginning is kind of talk about the, the engagement between the microbiota and the, the microbiome as a whole and immune response and the role that the microbiome plays. And then we'll talk through some of the dysfunctions that can occur and how those dysfunctions impact immune response, right? So I'm gonna share my screen. And when I do that, I'll turn off my camera so I'm not dis distracted by my own um, silly looks and expressions like I like to make. So let me do that. And Reg, you can see my screen. Is there, does it look like the slides? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. So the first thing to, to keep in mind and to understand is that 
you know, we, we think of them as different things. We think of the immune system as a separate system. We think of the human microbiota, the microbiome as kind of a separate system. They are one and the same because we have to remember that the human is a holobiont, which is a super organism, right? Every square millimeter of the body is, is essentially covered by some type of microorganism or the other. And so there's been this through the course of evolution, this really intimate uh, co-evolution between our immune system and the microbes that are present all over our body. Because keep in mind, the big role of the immune system is to monitor microbes, right? And they're monitoring microbes in a sea of microbes. Uh, and I'll talk about some of those specifics as, as we get along, but they are essentially one in the same. The immune system and the microbiota are essentially part of the same exact system. And I hope that by the end of this talk, that'll become even more clear. Um, and, and what'll become clear is that the immune system would cease to function without the microbiome. And so this act of symbiogenesis that's occurred over a long period of time that created this holobiome is true at the cellular level itself. There is a, a direct and clear symbiogenesis between our immune cells and, the, and their function and the microbiome and, their, and its function as well. One thing uh, important to review, and I know, uh, you know, of course, the kinetics of the immune response is, is a review for all of you guys. You, you, you're all experts in this area, but we, of course, have the innate and the adaptive immune response. And one thing that's really important to point out here is during the innate immune response, inflammation is key, right? Inflammation functions in many different important ways during that initial phase of the innate immune response. And then as we get into the late innate immune response and our dendritic cells and macrophages help shuttle us into the adaptive immune response, the, the component that takes a, uh, a couple of days, we need to have this anti-inflammatory step in between. So the immediate and the quick acting innate immune response is actually highly dependent on inflammation as a method of functionality. And then as we're moving into the long-term immunity, the adaptive immune response, and certainly the part that really clears the pathogen, we are also dependent on an anti-inflammatory injunction there because of course, continued inflammatory response by the immune system will actually lead to more disease than, than actual control of the pathogen. And, you know, and when you look at things like your early um, uh, innate response, your late innate response, whether it's um, the, the very first step in, in the infection of your cells, in this case, your airway cells, the, the um, phagocytosis of those cells itself by antigen presenting cells, or even the antigen presenting act themselves in the lymph nodes that occurs where your T helper cells help facilitate the amplification of B cells and so on, all of those steps occur in sequence. And every one of those steps requires the help and functionality of the microbiome. And we'll go through some of those specifics, right? So this is where we will we'll begin the journey to really illustrate that the microbiome is absolutely critical in the kinetics of our immune response, the ability of our immune system to respond, and the ability of the uh, immune system to actually survey the, uh, the body and, and protect against incoming pathogens. One of the things that's really important to note is that when you look at the, the various lymphoid tissue in the body, you've got your primary lymphoid tissue, things like thymus and bone marrow. These are things we're born with, of course. And then you've got the secondary um, lymphoid tissue, uh, things like the, uh, the lymph nodes, the, um, the, the spleen, the Paris patches, the mesenteric lymph nodes. All of these are sites of immune maturation. These are areas where our immune cells go to become activated, mature, and so on. All of these secondary sites are impacted by the microbiome. So that's a, that's a big picture look on the segregation of immune functionality. And what we find is that the thymus works fine, the bone marrow works fine, it's producing the precursor immune cells, the naive uh, immune cells, the T cells, and so on. But they have to go into areas like 
the, the payers patches the mesenteric lymph nodes and all that to mature. And those sites are controlled by the microbiome in large part. Now, of course, all of the action that takes place within the body, this battle against pathogens is occurring within the mucosa, right? The mucosa is, is the largest surface inside the body. It's about 400 square meters in surface area. Of course, compare that to the skin, which we used to always think about as one of the largest um, surface areas in the body. The skin is only about two square meters in size, and you've got the, in, the internal part, the mucosa, that's over 400 square meters. So every entry point, whether it's to the oral cavity, the eyes, the nose, the urogenital tract, everything ends up entering into mucosa. That's where the battle takes place. And it's of course the largest portion of the immune system. Most of it's found in the gut. So there's, there's all of this immunological activity that occurs in the mucosa and it lines every entry into the body, right? So a pathogen, it would be very hard for a pathogen to enter the system without entering in through the mucosa, which makes it then the largest site of immune sampling because everything we eat ends up uh, at the top layer of a mucosa. So all the immune sampling essentially occurs in the mucosa. So a lot of what we're talking about is really the immunobiology of the mucosa itself, which is where all of the action takes place. That's the main area of surveillance that your immune system has to has to provide protection against. It's your immune cells are swimming through and, and uh, migrating through the, all of this, the mucosal surface area to look for infectious agents, new viruses, new bacteria, things that are coming in that may cause illness. And, um, and all of this area is covered with microbes, right? If you think about the job that the immune cell has at hand, where you, if you're an immune cell and your job is to survey a certain um, area of the body and, and you're looking for viruses or bacteria or, or fungi that can cause illness all the while, that entire area that you're serving is already covered with viruses, bacteria, protozoa, and so on, it becomes an almost impossible task for that immune cell to properly survey the body and understand which microbes are friend and which microbes are foe, right? So that's the part that becomes absolutely critical in understanding the role of the microbiota in the functionality of the immune system. So I use this as an analogy, you know, imagine our mucosa is crowded shoulder to shoulder like this with microbes all the time. And the vast majority of microbes are endogenous microbes. They're commensal, they don't, necessarily, they don't cause any issue. Some of them are highly beneficial. Many of them may be just kind of neutral, just there, not necessarily creating a lot of benefit, but not creating any negative response either. But among this sea of microbes, you know, you've got over 40 trillion microbial organisms living in the mucosa with inside the body, considering all sections of the body. Then you've got somewhere around 200 million immune cells that are responsible for surveying all of this. So it's a, it's a 200,000 to one ratio of microbes to immune cells. So that's a, that's a really profound difference in the number of immune cells that, there are, that are present in order to survey all the areas of the body. And you know, imagine you have the C and maybe there are two or three microbes within the C that are actually infectious or problematic. How would the immune cell that's surveying this area actually pick up on these pro potentially problematic organisms. The only way they can do that is if all the other organisms around them are acting as the neighborhood watch. If the other commensal microbes are actually acting as a neighborhood watch, acting as the eyes and ears of the immune system, alerting the immune system to the presence of an invading organism that shouldn't be in that ecosystem, right? And that's essentially what is happening. That's called the immune crosstalk that occurs. And I promise I'm not gonna go through this um, diagram in any sort of detail because it, it, it might give people a headache, but what we really are trying to show here in this illustration is across the epithelial barrier, and this occurs throughout all different parts of the body, uh, from the mucosa where the microbiota sits, down into the lamina propria, the basal lateral circulation, where a lot of the immune cells are concentrated, there's continuous crosstalk between the microbes in this space uh, 
and then the immune cells that are functioning down below. And this occurs in the, in the lung mucosa. This occurs in every other part of the body as well. This crosstalk is absolutely critical for the functionality of the immune system. And we'll illustrate a couple of examples here. So here specifically, let's look at viral infections. During a norovirus infection, there are lactobacilli species in the digestive tract um, and other commensal organisms as well that will trigger the release of interferon beta and interferon gamma, which then alerts the innate immune system to the presence of the virus itself, right? So until the neighboring, so when norovirus comes in, it starts infecting one of the epithelial cells um, until the lactobacilli in that region sense it, sense the, the presence of that virus, sense the presence of the distress in the cell that is now uh, being infected, and then signals to the immune system, it becomes a delayed process for the immune system to ever recognize that infection in the presence of that pathogen. So to speed up the innate immune response, the surrounding commensal organisms actually release chemokines and cytokines and things like interferons to recruit the immune cells to that region to respond, right? And then other nutrients like vitamin A, for example, provides a substrate for the commensal bacteria to make these interferons. So some of the micronutrients that we know are good for the immune system are, are actually required by microbes in order for them to conduct their signaling. Here's another example during a rotavirus um, infection, bacterial flagellin from commensal bacteria, they activate the expression of pattern recognition receptors, so PRRs, that are absolutely critical, which then triggers the expression of toll-like receptor 5 on the, on the surfaces of our cells. And this stimulates the release of something called interleukin-22, which then helps repair the damaged epithelium that was infected in the cells that, were, that underwent apoptosis or the cells that were killed by cytot cytotoxic T cells. Um, and then it also uh, it increases the expression of interleukin-18, which induces apoptosis in infected cells. So it facilitates this immune turnover. Right, so this um, the release of um, interleukin twenty two uh, concurrently with interleukin eighteen allows for the infected cells to induce apoptosis, so they stop becoming viral production um, uh, factories. And then when those cells undergo apoptosis, the interleukin-22 helps repair the damaged epithelium, thereby fixing that neighborhood. And, and the stimulus for this comes from bacterial flagellin from commensal bacteria in that local region, right? So that, that's amazing when you think about the, cr the critically important step of, of clearance of infected cells and then the replacement of those infected cells with new healthy cells, that is a critically important function in our ability to deal with pathogens, in this case, rotavirus. And that function is outsourced to commensal bacteria. The signaling, at least, of it is, is outsourced to commensal bacteria in that local area. Here's another example where Bifidobacterium brevi, in particular, uh, especially when combined with uh, different prebiotics, in this case, uh, galacto-oligosaccharides and fructo-oligosaccharides were studied. They've been shown to actually prevent rotavirus infection by increasing interferon gamma IL-4, TNF-alpha, and toll-like receptor 2 expression in mucosal immune cells as part of the defense. So when the virus enters into the system, because you have an upregulated immune response or, or what I call a state of functional readiness within the immune system, especially with the activation of things like toll-like receptors uh, and interferon gamma and interferon, as you know, uh, inhibits viral replication and, and, and so on. This puts the biota in the lungs when it detects the presence of, of the influenza virus and, and especially when it starts de detecting the presence of infected cells, cells that are infected by the influenza virus, the lung microbiota actually signals to the gut microbiota, and then the gut microbiota creates the recruitment tools in order to, to uh, mobilize the immune system to the respiratory tract itself. And, and when the influenza virus is present in the lungs, the commensal bacteria in the gut increase the presence of innate immune cells 
in the lungs by causing the release of cytokines like interleukin-33, interleukin-1 alpha, interleukin-1 beta, 12, interferon gamma, and so on. And this causes more natural killer cells, dendritic cells, and macrophages to end up in the lungs. How that communication is occurring between the, the lung microbiota and the gut microbiota is still not known. The, the signals have been picked up, but how they are communicating is still a bit of a mystery, right? But just think about how fascinating that is that one, one section of the microbiota can actually signal to, the, to the, what I call the central command center, which is in the gut, and then the gut mobilizes the immune response in the lungs. When virus is low and not present, gut commensals do the exact opposite, and they in fact stimulate the release of anti-inflammatory compounds like IL-10. Right, IL-10 is incredibly important to bring down sustained inflammatory response throughout the body, because remember, um, when we looked at the immune kinetics, once you have the induction of the inflammatory component of the response, you need to migrate towards the anti-inflammatory co component as you're moving into the adaptive response, which means that you need specific anti-inflammatory compounds. IL-10 is one of those critical anti-inflammatory compounds, and that is also uh, stimulated by and secreted by the gut commensal uh, bacteria. This balancing act is, uh, is called as is an example of the gut lung axis, where microbes in the lung communicate with microbes in the gut to inform of the presence of pathogen, which is really quite fascinating. Staph aureus, for example, on airway surfaces can recruit monocytes that then mature to macrophages through the activation of toll-like receptor 2, which we heard about earlier, and this is during a lung, an active lung infection, and this leads to a reduction in the damage to the lung tissue during the acute phase of the, uh, of the infection itself. So Staph aureus um, it actually plays an important role in the immunopathology of dealing with that infection. When you look at respiratory uh, commensal bacteria like Cornium bacterium, they, it modulates toll-like receptor 3 antiviral response to RSV by enhancing the production of TNF-alpha, interleukin-6, interferon gamma, interferon uh, beta, and so on, through also increasing T cell proliferation in that local area. So there are specific microbes that seem to be able to defend against specific pathogens that show up. So at the end of the day, having a diverse, healthy, balanced microbiota plays a critical role. If you're missing or you have low levels of some of these commensal organisms, uh, the ability of the immune system to react becomes compromised. We also know that butyrate from commensal bacteria, that's commensal bacteria in the colon for the most part, uh, can lower inflammatory damage in the post-early innate response by activating something called GPR, these G protein coupled receptors on the surfaces of cells. Um, and and that's, uh, that creates a stimulation of interleukin-22 as well, right? So butyrate from the colon that's being made in the colon by the digestion of starches, resistant starches, prebiotics and so on by your gut commensal bacteria like Fecalum bacteria prosnitsi. Keep that name in mind because that, be that becomes important towards the end of the presentation. So think about it. You've got Fecalum bacteria prosnitsi in, in your colon. That bacteria is converting uh, resistant starches, certain types of complex carbohydrates, prebiotics, into butyrate and other short chain fatty acids, that butyrate can migrate through different parts of the body and can actually lower inflammation in sites of active infection. It can actually activate GPR uh, receptors on cell surfaces to release interleukin-22, which then helps the epithelium repair itself, right? Remember interleukin-22 plays a role in the replacement of damaged epithelial cells. So that recovery from the, in, from the infection and all of the damage associated with fighting the infection, that recovery portion is also driven by the microbiota. And there's another example, Lactobacillus crispactus, when dominant in the vaginal canal, crispactus is one of three, in, which includes inners, um, which, uh, and gen size, another one that, that uh, tend to be 
predominant uh, microbes in the vaginal canal of, of women who have healthy uh, you know, vaginal microbiotas, when lactobacillus crispactus is dominant, it actually can decrease HIV infection rate. And this was shown in a study in South African women, and it does it by inhibiting viral function, right? So the local lactobacilli that are sitting there in the mucosal surface, when that mucosal surface is exposed to HIV, the, the lactobacilli itself can decrease the rate of infection because of its ability to induce antiviral function in the, in the vaginal epithelium and, and uh, in fact, mobilize the immune response against the HIV virus. So really, really critical. These are just some you know, examples put together to really illustrate how the microbiome actually facilitates immune response. And in fact, one of the critical things, and this is two follow-up studies, I think, done by uh, very similar research groups. This one published in 2012, this one published in 2020. Um, what they showed here in this first paper published in Cell uh, was that commensal bacteria actually calibrate the activation threshold of the innate antiviral immunity, right? What does that mean? Well, they, they concluded that collectively the data indicated that commensal driven signals, so signals from our commensal bacteria, provide the tonic immune stimulation that establishes the activation threshold of the innate immune system required for optimal antiviral immunity. What they started to see back in 2012 was that there were signals from the commensal microbiota that created the impetus for the innate immune cells to respond to the presence of a pathogen, in this case, a viral pathogen specifically. And then now fast forward about eight years later, they actually figure out, figured out what that specific signal was. And what they found was type one interferon signaling from the microbiome was shown to be not only uh, you know, an important measure, but required to tone and poise dendritic cells to respond to pathogen entry. And this was especially important for antiviral functions. Without the signal from the microbiome, dendritic cells could not mount a response, right? That is a critical part here. So the, a lot of this study was done, of course, on no biotic mice, so mice that are raised in sterile environments, so they don't have a microbiome yet they have all the immune function, they have all the immune tissue, they produce all of their innate immune cells, your dendritic cells, macrophages, natural killer cells, they produce all their T cells and B cells. And when they in introduce a viral pathogen into these organisms, the viral pathogen will enter, start infecting cells, and the innate immune cells, one of the first reactors, especially the dendritic cells, literally stands by and watches and cannot respond to the presence of that pathogen. That was what was so profound in this, in this development from the studies that had started eight years ago, is not only does it modulate, does it support the immune response, it's absolutely required for the immune system to even be able to respond to the presence of a pathogen. That's why I said in the beginning, that one of the things we will hopefully illuminate is that the immune system would cease to exist and cease to function without the microbiota. Now, of course, most of us, nobody knows an, a human that doesn't have a microbiota, right? Everybody has one, but the type of microbiota also matters, right? How healthy the microbiota is, what the characteristics of the microbiota are actually matter quite a bit as well. And we'll illustrate that towards the end of the talk, but keep this in mind. That, that in order for the innate immune cells to even respond to the presence of a pathogen, it requires signals from the microbiome. Now on top of facilitating immune response and on top of signaling to the immune system that a, that a pathogen is present, on, on top of facilitating the immune response by recruiting immune cells to the site of action, and on top of actually facilitating the repair, the post-infectious repair of the tissue, there are commensal bacteria in our system that themselves can have direct antiviral effects, right? Even without the immune system.
And so that's a couple of examples here. Now, of course, these are this is my favorite organism. Uh, you know, we work a lot with the with the uh, Bacillus endospores, and the Bacillus endospores are amazing organisms when you look at all of the things that they do within the system. And here are some examples of their ability to create direct uh, effect against viral pathogens. And this study shows that B. subtilis and the surfactant that it produces prevents the invasion from a specific type of coronavirus. And again, this is not SARS-CoV-2. This is other types of coronaviruses known uh, as, transmi as transmissible gastroenteritis virus. So this is a coronavirus that actually infects the gut, similar to SARS-CoV-2. We, we now know that SARS-CoV-2 also infects the gut quite, quite well, along with the upper respiratory tract and so on. But Bacillus septilis, which is a gut commensal organism, actually produces a surfactant that has a direct antiviral effect on that virus. There's also anti-influenza activity of Bacillus subtilis. Uh, they found that it produces a powerful antiviral compound called P18 that completely neutralizes influenza virus in vitro, right? And other studies have demonstrated this strain in, in vivo antiviral effect as well. So the ability of this commensal bacteria to protect its host from viral pathogens, it goes beyond the ability to support the immune response. It can also do it quite directly. Here's another type of compound that Bacillus subtilis produces. Uh, and this is antiviral activity of uh, antimicrobial lipopeptide from Bacillus subtilis. This is a antimicrobial lipopeptide uh, containing surfactant uh, and fengicin. And fengicin is actually an antibacterial as well and shown to have um, strong antibacterial activity against MRSA, for example, right? The NIH published a study, I think it was in 2018, showing that people who were well colonized with, with Bacillus subtilis had Bacillus subtilis that produced fengicin, and the fengicin that the Bacillus subtilis produced actually inhibited the growth of uh, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. MRSA, of course, one of the one of the scariest types of infections, and especially the new new age versions of MRSA. There's, you know, MRSA is responsive to 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 a small class of antibiotics, but now there's a new version of MRSA that's uh, that doesn't respond to any antibiotic at all, and this fengicin from Bacillus subtilis actually inhibits all forms of methicillin resistant Staph aureus. And in fact, the people that had good colonization from subtilis did not have any MRSA on any sites in the body, especially not in their nose, in their upper respiratory tract and so on. But the same thing, this fengicin produced by Bacillus subtilis can in, uh, inactivate um, uh, PRV, uh, porcine parvovirus, Newcastle disease virus, and other in, in infectious viruses as well. So a whole number of types of viruses. And then there are also antiviral leavens that are produced by Bacillus subtilis that are found in things like honey. This is uh, environmental bacillus that we may pick up into our system, but it, they've shown that it can inhibit things like adenovirus. Uh, including uh, respiratory uh, RNA virus like H5N1 and enteric adenovirus, uh, which is a type 40 DNA virus. So maybe this is some of the immune benefits that honey provides us is, is having these kinds of compounds in it because of microbes that produce it naturally. So, you know, not only is the microbiota um, directly responsible for the ability of the immune system to respond to the presence of the pathogen. The microbiota also orchestrates the response. It controls the kinetics of the response. It shuttles the, it helps shuttle the immune system from the in, innate inflammatory response to the adaptive and the anti-inflammatory steps within that. It also supports the regeneration of the damaged cells that have been infected and damaged through the process. And then of course the microbiota, at, at least certain uh, components within the microbiota like Bacillus subtilis can actually directly have an antiviral, antimicrobial, antipathogen response in the body itself. And so it becomes clear that when you disrupt the, the, the microbiota, 
immune system, the immune response becomes clearly disrupted as well. And this has been shown on studies using antibiotics, where they find that antibiotics found to weaken the body's ability to fight off disease, uh, collateral damage. This, this paper is, um, is titled uh, Detrimental Effects of Antibiotics on the Development of Protective Immune Memory. So it can have uh, an, an impact on long-term immune memory as well. Right? So that's something important to note. Not only is it compromising acute response, but it can also com uh, compromise immune memory for the long term, having true immunity. And that may be something that becomes important in COVID as well, because when you think about COVID, you know, one of the things we're all hoping so that this, this virus stops rampaging through the world is that once you're infected or once you're exposed, for example, to the vaccine, that you have some form of immune memory so that you cannot become reinfected and become a vector again, right? And so compromised microbiota will actually affect immune memory as well. Here's another, uh, this is an article more, um, you know, antibiotics weaken the flu defenses in the lungs. And this is, these are more uh, review papers on how antibiotics causing dysbiosis uh, to the microbiota actually have a direct impact on the ability of the immune system to respond. And this has, an, uh, this has been shown uh, extremely clearly in checkpoint inhibitor therapy in cancer patients, right? So there's a number of papers on this where they show that the use of the antibiotics, uh, you know, has a huge impact on the efficacy of immune checkpoint inhibitors. And of course, immune checkpoint inhibitors counts on the ability of our own immune system to go after the cancer cells, particularly T cells. And if you have antibiotic exposure before immunotherapy, the ability of the immunotherapy to function actually becomes severely compromised. So they concluded that the gut microbiota plays a critical role in the anti-tumor immune response. And there's an increase, there's increasing data showing that antibiotics change the composition of the gut microbiota. So of course, when the composition of the gut microbiota is disrupted, immune response is going to be disrupted and affects the efficacy of immune checkpoint therapy. And in fact, they finally concluded that, the, that their findings of their meta-analysis indicated that antibiotic use is negatively associated with overall survival and progression-free survival in cancer patients treated with immunotherapy, right? That is huge. When you think about the kinds of cancers that can respond to immunotherapy, things like non-small cell lung, lung cancer or uh, melanoma, uh, they, they can respond well to immunotherapy, but only about 25, 30% of people that get immunotherapy get very positive responses. The other 60 to 70% get almost no response or a toxologic, toxolo toxicological response. Um, and the idea here is the difference there between the people that get a positive response and the people that don't is that the people that don't have a disrupted microbiota, right? So if we hone in on this, and we are in fact working with a couple of research groups on studies on this of how can we modulate the microbiota prior to starting immunotherapy? Because if we can increase the response rate from 25, 30% to even 50%, think of all the lives we would save, right? And so it's just a modulation of the microbiota to put the microbiota back in its healthiest characteristic form. And we'll talk about what that healthy characteristic form is. But again, this is an, a, a really good example of how the microbiome dramatically um, influences immune response. Now, what's critical here in terms of how a disrupted microbiota can impact immune response. And there's a couple of different ways. Well, not a couple, there's a bunch of different ways, but I'm gonna hone in on what is likely the most profound way in how a disrupted microbiota alters immune response, right? And, and when we, when we wanna think about that and hone in on that, we really have to understand the language used by the microbiota to communicate with the immune system. Now, there's a number of things. There's things like short chain fatty acids, there's uh, increased expression of pattern recognition receptors and so on. But one of the key factors in recruitment and, and facilitating the kinetics of the immune response is the microbiota uses inflammatory signaling.
right? These are the key inflammatory markers. You saw some of them in the examples I gave you a few slides ago on the response rate of the immune system to the presence of pathogens and how the microbiota can actually trigger immune response by utilizing these types of inflammatory signals. But keep in mind, these kind of inflammatory signals, you guys have all measured them in immune panels. You, you look at some of these inflammatory signals for certain disease pathologies, to look at progression of disease or severity of disease. All of these are well-known uh, chemical sig signals within the, uh, within the body, cytokines and interferons and so on. And all of these are associated with disease, right? And in fact, they're associated with chronic disease. So when these things are elevated, you have the presence of chronic illness. In the US, at least one in two adults, 50% of adults have at least one chronic disease one in four adults, 25% of all adults in the US have multiple chronic uh, illnesses, two or more. These are the most common chronic illnesses and all of these are associated with chronic inflammation as is measured by these particular markers. IL-6, of course, one of the main ones, interleukin beta, TNF, these are critically important markers of chronic illness. They are also the most important signals that the microbiota uses to communicate with the immune system. So you're starting to understand here the big problem, right? Because when you have chronic disease, it means you have chronic low grade expression of these, um, of these types of signals. So you have elevated above normal levels of these signals going on in the body throughout the body all the time. Right, that's the, the, the chronic nature of it. And, and that becomes extremely problematic because that disrupts immune signaling between the microbiota and the immune system. So an example of that, uh, I like to use analogies when I talk about these things. So an example of that is, let's say that an invading pathogen, let's take a virus, for example, uh, we'll use an analogy that the invading pathogen is a fire right? So you've got an active fire. That fire is going to disrupt the ecosystem. So that, that uh, invading pathogen, that virus, as it starts infecting epithelial cells, is disrupting that ecosystem. In this analogy, that disruption is the smoke, right? Now, the microbiota acts as a smoke detector because the microbiota picks up that disruption, the disruption signal, just like a smoke detector would pick up the presence of smoke. Now, like a smoke detector, the microbiota sends off signals. And those signals are cytokines and interleukins like IL-1, IL-6, TNF, and so on. Now, the immune system is like the fire department who's looking for those signals. And when they hear or see those signals, they come rushing just like the firefighters would, come rushing to the site of the fire, and then they have the ability to put the fire out, right? But in, the, but in chronic illness, when you have chronic low-grade inflammation, what you have is you have these signals going off everywhere in the body all the time. Right? And so when, an, when a pathogen does enter and the smoke is detected by the microbiota and the microbiota sends out those same signals, that particular signal of the, of the presence of a new pathogen gets lost because that same signal is going on throughout the body. So the immune system, the firefighters, cannot hone in on that site of infection fast enough to really start to control that pathogen. If you think about it uh, in the case of um, influenza or any, any other respiratory virus, right? If the virus enters the, the, the respiratory cells, it starts infecting the respiratory cells, the local, the microbiome, the commensal bacteria, both in the, in, the, in the lungs and in the digestive tract are signaling to the immune system that something is occurring there and they need to go and pay attention. And if it takes the immune system a long time because it's distracted by all these other alarms that are going on throughout the body, that gives the virus a longer period of time to incubate, to infect more cells, to increase the viral load in that local region. And then when the immune system finally does react to it, then the viral load is much greater that elicits a much bigger innate immune response. And now the body is in trouble with the, with the risk of moving into what they call the cytokine storm, right? So now we're getting severe disease response because of an overactive innate immune system.
right? Because the, the response has to be bigger because the viral load is now larger. So this lost signal issue is one of the biggest uh, drivers of compromised immune response in the body. And this is the molecular tie to the, to the presence of chronic illness and compromised immune response. And all of this comes back to the microbiota itself. The reason is the biggest source of this chronic low grade inflammation comes from a dysfunctional microbiota and something called leaky gut, right? So you have many different ways where dysfunctional microbiota can impact the immune system. For example, segmented filamentous bacteria, they can in increase inflammatory damage of tissue and drive autoimmune development. It can create the bystander effect in an immune response, which creates an autoimmune response to your own tissue. Um, you know, long-term uh, infectious pathogens like HSV, CMV can infect T cells, mon mon monocytes and macrophages. Epstein-Barr virus can infect B cells. These types of pathogens can compromise immune response because they are directly infecting immune cells themselves. But one of the key areas that is probably the most profound impactful reason why we end up having compromised immune response is something called free LPS or elevated levels of LPS in circulation and also chronic inflammation that comes from a disrupted gut because LPS, this lipopolysaccharide is actually made by gram negative bacteria in the, di in the gut mucosa. Right, and, and we know that certain parts of the gut mucosa, uh, certain parts of the gut microbiota are predominantly gram negative. And so there's lots of LPS being produced. And if you have a compromised barrier or a leaky gut, you get a lot of translocation of this LPS from the mucosa into the basolateral circulation. So it enters into circulation where LPS will raise havoc in the body. So we're gonna go through some of those, the impact of LPS in the body. This process is called metabolic endotoxemia, the translocation of LPS through a compromised intestinal barrier into circulation is called metabolic endotoxemia because it occurs at larger levels during the process of eating and digesting food. You actually see this huge postprandial rise in serum LPS levels um, after and during the course of digesting food. Now, what happens with LPS when it enters into the uh, circulatory system, LPS gets bound by something called LBP, which is LPS binding protein. That LPS-LBP complex is then taken to innate immune cells that have a CD14 toll-like receptor complex, and it binds to those innate immune cells. When it binds to that complex, it initiates an immune cascade which actually leads to the activation of NF-kappa B. And eventually that NF-kappa B cascade leads to the uh, significant release of TNF-alpha, interleukin-1 beta, and interleukin-6. Now, these are of course really important when there's an acute infection going on and you want the microbiota to release these compounds to signal to the immune system, but you do not want these things, these particular compounds being released chronically every day after every single meal throughout the body. That's my metabolic endotoxemia, and that's what's happening in, in conditions uh, associated with chronic illness and that are also associated with immune compromise, right? So in this, and at the end of the day, the innate immune cells become activated by LPS and creates this pro-inflammatory cytokine cascade that affects all parts of the body. It, it does so um, you know, locally in areas like the brain, the joints and so on, but you also see the effects systemically. And this effect has real impact on health and wellness in particular, when you look at the clinical manifestations of having elevated levels of LPS in the serum, you find that everything under metabolic syndrome, for example, is driven by elevated serum LPS levels. Things like heart disease, dyslipidemia, hypertension, type two diabetes, cancer, dementia, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, 
all of these things are driven by elevated LPS levels in, in, the, in serum, the condition called metabolic endotoxemia, right? And these are the conditions that are most severely impacted by viral infections. And in fact, when you look at the studies did, it published in Diabetes Care by the American Diabetic Association, they show that the gut-derived endotoxin LPS acts as a primary insult to activate the inflammatory state that contributes to metabolic disease. And they in fact concluded that chronic experimental metabolic endotoxemia induces obesity and diabetes, right? So, so that dysfunction in the gut that leads to a compromised intestinal lining, which allows for the translocation of LPS, that's the start of metabolic disease, metabolic syndrome, and it also functions concurrently in compromising immune response. I'll tie that up for you a little bit better here. Uh, but let me show you some more evidence on the role of endotoxemia in metabolic disease. Here's something called a Cordioprev study. This was 462 patients over, I think, 60 months. And they were looking at a number of uh, biomarkers to try to predict the ones that provided the best uh, capability of, of indicating who would develop type 2 diabetes. They show that high postprandial endotoxin precedes the development of type 2 diabetes, and they in fact suggest that LPS plasma levels is a, is a biomarker predictor of type 2 di diabetes development. LPS levels in, in circulation was the only thing they found to be completely predictive of the development of type 2 diabetes, right? So having LPS, elevated levels of postprandial LPS is a function of a disrupted microbiota. And that same function also compromises the immune response uh, and, and is also driving chronic illness. Here's another example where um, LPS from the gut can actually make its way into uh, the deeper recesses of the brain, like the hypothalamus, and cause inflammation in that region, um, thereby disrupting the gut-brain signaling, causing something called central insulin resistance, which means they're disrupting the brain's ability to read the blood sugar levels. So the pancreatic islet cells are working just fine. They can make all the insulin you want. They can release all the insulin you want, but your brain cannot read the blood sugar levels adequately. And this ha happens irrespective of body weight. So no longer do you need to be obese for a period of time before you develop insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. Now, because of the, of the disruption to the gut microbiota and that leakiness in the gut, LPS can get into the brain and cause central insulin resistance. And of course, LPS or metabolic endotoxemia is the key molecular link between why obesity leads to ele uh, higher levels of cardiovascular disease, right? So all of these chronic illnesses, type 2 diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, uh, hypertension, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, dementia, Alzheimer's, all of these things are driven by the same kind of dysfunction, the same uh, microbiota disruption, the compromised lining of the gut, the leakiness in the gut, and then that translocation of LPS. And of course, that disrupted microbiota also creates compromised immune response. So it's no surprise that all of these conditions, chronic conditions that are driven by a disrupted microbiome and microbiota are also the conditions that have the highest mortality rates in COVID is an example, right? So if you look at cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, hypertension, even cancers, there's studies on cancers and metabolic endotoxemia, uh, which, uh, which in fact, um, some meta-analysis show that high levels of LPS in serum is, a, is the key driver of cachexia in cancer, and cachexia uh, accounts for about 60% of the mortality in cancer, right? So all of these conditions are driven by microbiota disruption, LPS endotoxemia, and these same conditions are the ones with the highest mortality rates when we're dealing with this new pathogen, right? So it becomes, it starts to become really clear that what we really need to do is start to focus on the microbiota. We need to focus on the leakiness in the gut. We need to increase the diversity of the microbiota, improve certain characteristics of the microbiota before all of these systems can work uh, functionally, and you, you compare, take someone with cardiovascular disease or diabetes, they have seven to 10 times the mortality rate as somebody that doesn't have these pre-existing conditions. And the, def the definitive component of these pre-existing conditions 
is a disrupted microbiota and elevated LPS. Sure enough, when you look at most recent studies, LPS in circulation actually directly inter, uh, inter works with the spike protein from SARS-CoV-2. So SARS-CoV-2's uh, S protein, spike protein, can actually bind to E. coli LPS in human cells. Other pathogens have shown that they can actually integrate with the, with the LPS and that increases their ability to enter into the cells. Right, because uh, LPS is a um, is a lipid, uh, has a lipid tail, so it integrates well into the into the membranes of the cells, and so viruses, pathogens have evolved the ability to uh, create conjunctions with LPS in order to enter the cell, and and we're seeing that there's some similar effect with SARS-CoV-2 as well, you know, and and there's a direct interaction that they showed between SARS-CoV-2 protein and LPS, and this leads to pro-inflammatory actions. So this is in the in the mouse study that they've done, and they, they conclude that having an increase in LPS could lead to a more severe COVID-19 type of infection, right? So there's already some, some direct ties between COVID-19 and the presence of LPS. And remember, elevated presence of LPS is a function of a disrupted microbiota. Other studies have shown, this is a, a study that, um, you know, looked through the scientific reasoning and connection between the gut microbiota status in COVID-19. And they do also mention that LPS can cause, uh, can cross the GI mucosa because of the leaky uh, intestinal tight junctions. This is seen in obesity and obesity is clearly a significant risk factor for um, SARS-CoV or COVID-19 and severe COVID-19 response. So there seems to be a pathophysiological tie between the effects of metabolic endotoxemia and the, the, the risk of complications and the pro-inflammatory conditions associated with severe COVID response. Um, and then as you get a little bit deeper, then yes, and sure enough, the studies show that obesity is a direct uh, factor in driving higher risk or, or higher complications in COVID-19. And, um, and a lot of it comes back to glucose control, comes to chronic low-grade inflammation that is associated with obesity. And remember, poor glucose control, um, chronic low-grade inflammation in obesity starts with metabolic endotoxemia, starts with leakiness in the gut. It starts with a disrupted microbiota. All of that is, uh, is part of the cascading effects of a disrupted microbiota that eventually compromises the metabolic system and also makes people much more susceptible to infection. Here's a couple of studies that are very specific to COVID-19 and dysbiosis going on in the gut. This is one of the first studies uh, that were published by these authors where they looked at a number 15 or so COVID patients compared to 15 healthy, looking at full shotgun metagenomic sequencing in fecal samples between these two types of cohorts. And they found that there were certain signatures present in people who had COVID infections and severe COVID infections versus healthy normals that did not have COVID infections. And they found that Fecalum bacteria prosnitsi, remember this organism I mentioned earlier, would become important towards the end of the lecture, Fecalum bacteria prosnitsi is a critical keystone strain in your large bowel. It is known as an anti-inflammatory bacterium. It produces butyrate. And remember, butyrate is that important compound for bringing down the inflammatory response in the body. And Fecalum bacteria prosnitsi also improves tight junction function. And they found that people with severe COVID illness had a low level of fecalum bacteria uh, prosnitsi, and in fact was inversely correlated, meaning decreasing levels of fecalum bacteria prosnitsi was correlated with severity in, uh, in COVID response as well. And then markers of lower visceral fat uh, were positive health markers. And we've done a study, not published yet, but showing that if you increase bifidobacterium and fecalum bacteria prosnitsi, visceral fat levels go down. Again, tie back into metabolic health, uh, in low, chronic low-grade inflammation, the microbiota, and then of course, immune response. They also showed here that bifidobacteria was also negatively correlated with COVID-19. Uh, and as bifidobacterium was increased in the gut, the severity of the disease decreased. So the presence of certain microbes seem to be protective because they play critical roles in facilitating immune response. The same uh, authors did a second study where they also showed that opportunistic fungus like Candida albicans or urus or asparagus, 
all also were associated with severity in disease because these are the quintessential dysbiotic markers in a microbiota. In the world of functional medicine, when you're looking at microbiome stool samples, if you see an overgrowth of candida albicans or urus, it indicates that your microbiota is dysbiotic because these are opportunistic fungi. They only grow when the bacterial load within your microbiota is compromised and you have an imbalance in that bacterial load. So they're showing again that the severity of SARS-CoV-2 is, is dictated um, in part by your microbiota. And here's a much more direct study on this. Um, they looked, oops, Sorry, I went back. Uh, they looked, I think this was in, I can't remember how many patients, I think uh, somewhere around 100 patients. Um, and they followed these patients for up to 30 days past the infectious period as well, or at least past the symptomatic period. And again, what they found was the same thing that the other study found was that gut commensals with known immun immunomodulatory properties such as Fecalum bacteria prosnitsi, Eubacterium rectalis, and Bifidobacteria were underrepresented in patients uh, and remain low in samples collected up, up to 30 days, right? So there was a significant alteration in composition of the gut microbiota in patients with COVID-19 compared with non-COVID-19 individuals, um, irrespective of whether patients had received medication. So again, the microbiota and its ability to modulate immune response seems to be critical. And of course, they found other elevated cytokines, inflammatory cytokines, many of which we've already talked about. But in this case, they included things like C-reactive protein, lactate dehydrogenase, uh, aspirate aminotransferase, and so on, um, that are in addition, that are also associated with a disrupted immune response and microbiota. And here's a really important thing. We've all heard about COVID long haulers and what is going on with COVID long haulers who tend to have these symptoms for a long period of time, even after the, the primary symptoms like fever and all that have dissipated. And, and they suggest that the gut microbiota dysbiosis that is seen after the disease, right? That the, the dysbiosis persists that uh, disease that may impact the resolution of the disease and could contribute to persistent symptoms, highlighting a need to understand how the gut microorganisms are involved in inflammation and COVID-19. But you all already know that now because we've already shown a number of examples where the gut microbiota not is not only important for the uh, the elicitation and the organization of the immune response, but it's also important for the recovery from the severe immune response that damages parts of the body, right? So now it becomes uh, really clear that, okay, a compromised microbiota, right? That means having low diversity, having opportunistic growth of things like fungal organisms, having low levels of these keystone strains of bifidobacteria, like fecalum bacteria and bifidobacteria, having leakiness in the gut and elevated LPS levels. All of these things not only will compromise your immune response, they are also the risk factors uh, for the chronic illnesses associated with compromised immune response. And it also reduces the ability to recover from a, from a profound systemic uh, infection, right? So this plays the most critical role, I would argue, in anything we're doing for COVID, right? So th this, this is something that we really have to just grapple and understand and address. We have to address these features of the microbiota in order to really be able to address COVID. But what can you do about it? What can you do about elevated LPS levels in, in circulation that postprandial endotoxemia, the, the uh, leakiness in the gut? What can you do about low levels of fecalum bacteria and bifidobacteria? Fortunately, there are ways that you can modulate these things. This is one of the first papers we published and we've done studies subsequent to this we showed that when you have this severe postprandial endotoxemia, this is, um, you know, time zeros is at fasted state. This is up to five hours postprandial. This is the, not the, the level of serum LPS. Uh, in order to diagnose it as postprandial endotoxemia, you actually need about a 5x increase in serum LPS beyond the baseline, uh, the baseline level. So this is classic. Uh, postprandial endotoxemia. And when we put these individuals on a spore-based probiotic for 30 days, a specific formula of spore-based probiotic, after 30 days, we put them through the same challenge meal. 
this was the endotoxic response. It was completely blunted. And this was in the first pilot study of around 20 patients. And then we did a much larger study um, you know, that, that, that took into consideration a, a larger cohort of patients. And we saw the same thing where in the spore treatment group, after 30 days, the endotoxic response to food was reduced by over 45%. And what was scary about it is in the placebo group, not only was there, of course, no reduction, there was a significant increase in the amount of endotoxemia. So there's over a 60% difference between the two groups. But this part is scary. It means the leakiness in the gut is getting worse and, and the endotoxic response is getting more profound. So these individuals would respond even worse to being exposed to a pathogen like, co like SARS-CoV-2 uh, from this point, from that thir early 30 day period to even 30 days later, right? So this is a significantly easy and profound way to be able to reduce that postprandial endotoxemia and reduce serum LPS levels. Um, and, and then what can you do about the, the rest of the microbiota, increasing diversity and all that? We actually did a study where we took the same spore-based probiotic and we combined it with a prebiotic, uh, which is a, a oligosaccharide prebiotic. And what we found is that in, in subjects, you can dramatically increase the growth of Fecalum bacteria prosnitzi. I mean, look at that, it's a two log increase right? A two log increase is very significant. That's a hundred fold increase in the amount of Fecalum bacteria prosnitzi. Acromantia, which is another critical of uh, um, keystone bacteria, uh, also saw a significant upwards of two log increase. Lactobacilli saw a significant increase. Bifidobacteria saw a very measurable increase as well. So we can actually bring up the levels of these keystone strains. And this is shown in the full cohort data. Again, same thing. Fecalum bacteria prosnitzi, very significant increase. Bifidobacterium, very measurable in increase, about um, you know half a log or so. Uh, lactobacilli and other important organisms. So not only can we stop the LPS endotoxemia, we can seal up that leakiness in the gut. We can reduce the amount of LPS in circulation. We can also increase the growth of these protective organisms within the large bowel. We can absolutely modulate the microbiota for better immune function. And, and the, the bonus of that is this, the dysfunctions that lead to compromised immune response are the exact same dysfunctions that lead to increased risk for all of those chronic illnesses like diabetes, obesity, hypertension, and so on. So there's, there's a lot of power in these tools and there's a lot of capability in being able to modulate the microbiota for profound health outcomes. We can look at it uh, through the lens of immune function because we're all hyper uh, vigilant right now about immune function because of the pandemic. But everything we do to improve the immune function through the microbiota is going to have long-term lasting impact because it's also curbing the pathophysiology of chronic illness as well. So a quick conclusion page, I know I've gone a, bit, a little bit over. Um, a healthy, diverse microbiota provides critical signaling and energetics to the immune system, and of course helps elicit proper immune uh, function, higher pathogen load within the microbiota, pathogens like um, cytomegalovirus, you know, uh, herpes simplex virus, these kind of organisms that are that are allowed to uh, propagate within the the microbiota of the, or the microbiome of the body will actually compromise immune response. A disrupted microbiome leads to improper and attenuated immune response against pathogens, and disrupted microbiome is also the most prevalent source of chronic low-grade inflammation through endotoxemia and barrier dysfunction. And this pathophysiology is the biggest driver of compromised immune response in, in your average person, especially in those with chronic illness or pre-existing conditions. Immune support ingredients are important, things like vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, but you cannot take enough of those to overcome a dysfunctional microbiome. So it has to be used in conjunction with putting a focus on the microbiome. You cannot take enough vitamin C to overcome a se severe dysbiosis in the gut. That dysbiosis is always going to trump the vitamin C in terms of functionality. So you need both, right? So if your patients are focusing on, Im on immune support ingredients, you've got to get them thinking about the, the microbiome as well.
The success of preventative measures like vaccines, as you guys all know very well, vaccines are only as good as your immune system uh, allows them to be, right? Vaccines themselves are not going to confer immunity. Vaccines provide a target for the immune system to develop immunity. But if your immune system has compromised response, it's not going to respond appropriately to the vaccine. And the vaccine is not going to function the way it's supposed to, to provide this kind of long-term protective immunity to slow down the spread of this particular virus. So it becomes extremely important as your patients are going through and getting vaccines with the hope that the vaccine slows down the reproducing rate of this virus and slows down the pandemic, that people are paying attention to their microbiome because the microbiome is gonna dictate how well your body responds to the vaccine. And then also remember dysfunctional microbiome can impair memory immune uh, function as well. So we wanna preserve that memory function. Simple measures can take, make big differences in terms of practicality, diversifying the diet will create diversity within the microbiome, which is critically important. Lowering stress. Stress is a big inducer of leaky gut. And this time when we're all going through this crazy pandemic, of course, stress is highly prevalent, but we want to lower stress because stress is one of the biggest inducers of dysbiosis in the gut. And stress is also a big inducer of leakiness in the gut. We have to get outdoors more. We have to get in contact with um, natural uh, environments. Now, I know in many parts of the world, getting outdoors is not really an option because of the rules around the, the pandemic. But putting that aside, uh, we can do things like using the spore-based probiotic, the research probiotic to stop the endotoxemia, to start to increase the diversity and we have to focus on leaky gut solutions because leaky gut is at the root cause of all of these dysfunctions. We have to bring down systemic inflammation because systemic inflammation interferes with signaling that's required for immune system response. Certain prebiotics like oligosaccharides can have a huge impact on immune function. We showed, I showed one of the bullet points how bifidobacteria and galacto-oligosaccharides can work together to actually prevent rotavirus infection. And then uh, oligosaccharides can also increase the growth of some of these keystone bacteria. Polyphenols and omega fatty acids also are quite powerful, in particular polyphenols because of their ability to increase the growth of acromancia. And acromancia increases the production of, of mucin, which rebuilds the mucosal layer, which is that really important barrier. Omega fatty acids, especially high EPA omega fatty acids, actually reduce the um, inflammatory damage and oxidative stress that occurs in the gut lining, which can lead to uh, leakiness in the gut. So it becomes really important for repair. That is the, uh, the very last point. And I think... Um, Reggie, I don't know if we have time to take questions. If the audience does, I'm fine. I, I have time to take questions and I'm happy to do that. Um, and of course, you know, this, this talk is uh, being sponsored by Bio, uh, BioBalance with the Biospore Biotic. This is incidentally the product that we did use, a formulation that we use in the studies on endotoxemia itself, so. All right, thank you very much, Kiran. We would now like to open the floor for any questions. So please feel free to unmute your microphones if you have any questions. So Kiran, we have here um, questions already sent through the chat box. So first one is, what are the diagnostics for measuring LPS? Um, so that's a little bit difficult because LPS has a short half-life in serum once you pull it out of the body. Its half-life is about four hours. So unless you're able to measure it within four hours, it becomes very hard. Um, in, in the lab, when we're doing studies, what we have to do is freeze the samples at minus 80 in order to preserve it for longer periods of time so that we can batch the samples and, and get them all tested at once. Um, so you cannot necessarily do um, the, um, you cannot necessarily test LPS directly commercially but you can measure surrogate markers of LPS. So one of the things you can do is measure something called um, soluble CD14. Studies have shown that soluble CD14 increases concurrently with increased LPS, especially postprandially. So what you can do is have your patients come in, you take a fasting blood draw, um, and then have them go out and have lunch and come back within three, four hours of, ha of having had that lunch, and then do a second blood draw and you look 
at um, you look at the the difference between um, the baseline and then the postprandial levels of those uh, particular markers. So one is soluble CD14, another one is um, inoleukin um, IL1 beta, and then you can look at IL6 as well. So if you look at some of those as surrogate markers for the elevation in LPS, it'll give you a clue. Um, now in the US, we have certain immunoassays that you can do where we can actually directly measure LBP or LPS binding protein. Uh, LPS binding protein helps provide a, um, a surrogate marker identification for LPS as well. Second question is, what is the recommended maximum dose of spore-based probiotics in a day? Yeah, so the, the typical maintenance and therapeutic dose is about 4 billion a day. Um, now, there are some patients that we've worked with that we have temporarily increased the dose. For example, if they've traveled somewhere and they've got, uh, you know, a, a, a persistent gut infection, they're having longer term loose stool diarrhea, uh, we, would, we would go as, as high as 8 billion. So we'd go as high as double the dose uh, each day for a period of time, usually about 7 to 10 days. Um, there are some patients with autoimmune response uh, throughout the body. So, uh, you know, rosacea, acne, um, not acne, sorry, rosacea, psoriasis, um, where we found that for a short period of time, increasing the dose to 8 billion a day for about two, three weeks can really help bring them to the other side in terms of, uh, you know, resolution of that dysfunctional immune response. But for 90% of your patients, 4 billion a day uh, is, is perfect, both for therapeutic and maintenance as well. All right, thank you, Kiran. So, will there be any more questions from the from our doctors? Please feel free to unmute yourselves if you have questions. And if you if you think of something later on as well, please uh, get in touch with uh, with Reggie or Maris or um, anyone from their organization. Send them the question. Mm -hmm. We'll get them by email and we'll make sure to answer them as well. If you think of something as you go about your day, you know, in, in talking about this. All right. If there are no more questions, I'd like to wrap up this session by taking by thanking Kiran for taking time from his extremely busy schedule to be with us today. So to our doctors, if you would like to purchase our Biobalance Biospore, we will please reach out to us and you may inquire through Mira, Jane, and myself. So our Biospore Biotics contains 4 billion spore cells, including Bacillus, Subtilis and Clausy, Clausy, which has been repeatedly mentioned in the studies presented. So our Biospore Biotics repairs leaky gut, reduces inflammation, and restores immune function. It is safe and effective and stays alive and stable even at room temperature. All right. You may also visit the Biobalance website at biobalanceinstitute.com for the complete list of all the other supplements and products that we offer. Again, thank you very much for your time and we look forward to working with you in restoring health through balanced, personalized, and measured nutrition. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kiran. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you.